If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm T1 Glistenerelf. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you probably know that every now and then, you see a Yu-Gi-Oh game, or a Yu-Gi-Oh deck profile they call deck text deck profiles in that game. And there's a reason for that. It's actually because I do like Yu-Gi-Oh as well. I'm T1 Glistener Elf. Obviously, I'm going to be a bit partial to Magic the Gathering. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but they're apples and oranges. Uh, I like them both for very different reasons. On a fundamental or mechanical level, the games challenge you in different ways. I think that Magic the Gathering is a deeper game, even if just a bit. The way that Magic handles the stack versus Yu-Gi-Oh handles the chain, for instance. Uh, but those are minor complaints about the mechanics of the game. But as a company, for the most part, I actually prefer Wizards of the Coast over Konami, which is what runs Yu-Gi-Oh. And there are a few reasons for that. Pretty much all of my complaints about Yu-Gi-Oh are based on the company's re way that they've handled things over the years. And so here are five things, a quick little list for you, uh, that I don't like about Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> five reasons I prefer Magic, five reasons I prefer Wizards of the Coast over Konami, whatever. Alright, so but first I have to give you a little bit of context. This is important to note. In Magic the Gathering, wherever you go, as long as the game is played, you play it the same way. If you want to go to, for example, uh, Brazil, you want to go to Italy, the United States, Canada, China, wherever you want, the game will be the same. But that's not the case when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! There are two major, let's say, regions. There's the OCG, which stands for Original Card Game, and there's the TCG, Trading Card Game, of course. And those are actually divided by region. So, for example, in Japan and countries around it, they play the OCG. In North America and in Europe, we play the TCG, and I'm not sure about countries like Oceania, how that's handled, etc. But those are different regions with a lot, a lot of the issues that I have stem from this, and there's a reason for it. Back in the day, back in the day, uh, Konami is, the, again, the company that owns Yu-Gi-Oh!, but when they wanted to first start distributing in North America, they used a company called Upper Deck. Back in 2002, Upper Deck acquired, I guess, the rights to print these, well, not to print these cards, to distribute these cards. And they were given a ton of leeway in exchange for some percentage of what they made, going back to Konami, of course. Um, I'll get to that in just a little bit, <laughs> but first, first. So my first, we're getting into the actual video, my first problem with Yu-Gi-Oh! is that because of this OCG-TCG divide, there are, and this isn't even inherent to that divide, but it happens along those lines. There are different set releases. So, for example, if you want to get set X, it will come out in the OCG months before it will come out in the TCG. So if you live in Japan, you will get that card, whatever card it is you're looking for, and the archetypes that come along with it, and counter archetypes, etc., You'll get all of that months before someone, say, here in the United States will. I'm not a big fan of that. It creates a lot of problems. It creates these very different metagames between the two. Uh, and it just feels bad. Now, I mean, I know that's, that's just a feeling, but it's more than a feeling. I'm a Boston fan. <laughs> it's the fact that you feel a little bit... Um, you get the impression as a TCG player that if the OCG went away, the game would be gone, but if the TCG went away, they'd keep going along. Uh, they use the OCG, and there are some benefits to it, they use the OCG as a way to determine if the rarity was appropriate for a given card. Uh, sometimes they rare shift uh, when they move it over to TCG, usually in the wrong direction. Um, it lets you test out the metagame before you make decisions on what to ban before you make it to the TCG, because there are two ban lists that are separate for them. Uh, but that, that actually gets me into my next one, which is that 
Upper Deck Entertainment, Upper Deck Entertainment, Upper Deck, whatever, whatever, Upper Deck something or other, was given so much leeway in what they could design that they got to make their own cards, TCG exclusives, which unless all of those exclusives, exclusives are garbage fires, <laughs> will invariably create a different metagame. And spoiler alert, they're not. They're ten they tend to be pretty pushed cards, and that makes sense when you think about it. You don't sell more packs by making Skull Servants, or what's the magic equivalent? Storm Crows. <laughs> you don't do it by making intentionally weak cards. You do it by making pretty strong cards. We're looking more like Exodia than Skull Servant, if, if we can. And that kept happening over and over and over again. Now, Upper Deck only had Yu-Gi-Oh! Only had the rights to distribute for about seven years. It was 2002 until early 2009 when they were ordered by court to stop. <laughs> yeah, it, it ended... it didn't end very pleasantly between the two companies. It, it was pretty brutal. Uh, go look it up. It's on Wikipedia, yada yada yada, the sources below. Okay. Uh, but even to this day, we still get TCG exclusives, and this helps to perpetuate a difference between the metagames. This is why, one reason why, we have different ban lists between the two regions, OCG and TCG. And when we have to do a worldwide event, and they have to try somehow to create this combined worlds format, this is one reason why it looks so weird. <laughs> because players from both regions are trying to figure out what on earth they're doing with this completely new and ephemeral format. Okay, so that's another one of which I'm not a big fan. Next, if you are playing Magic the Gathering, no matter where you are in the world, the rules are the same. And that's because we have something called the Comprehensive Rules. This guidebook that has more than a hundred pages, if I remember correctly, of just rule after rule after rule after rule after rule, blah, 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 that helps to explain exactly what happens in the game. And there's a reason for this. In addition to the booklet that you get uh, in certain, what, structure decks or that sort of beginner products uh, to teach you how to play, you also get this ginormous rulebook so that everything is as clear as they can make it. Now this does have a bit of an issue. If you are not an English speaker, you're a bit out of luck because the comprehensive rules are understood in English. If you speak Spanish, they might be translated, but it's the English version that will be used to decide what the rules happen to be, just in case there happens to be a potential conflict in translations. Because of this OCG-TCG divide, there is no such thing. It's actually worse than that. <laughs> uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! not only does not have the equivalent of that, you will have cards with completely different rulings, explicitly different rulings, between the OCG and the TCG, even when there's not really a reason to suggest why that would be. Uh, there's not some understood difference in the fundamental rules between the OCG and the TCG, essentially it usually amounts to that's just how it is. Which is why these things keep perpetuating themselves, by the way. That's just how it's been for decades at this point now. <sighs> As someone who wants, if you want to try to be a judge, for example, in Magic the Gathering, you read over this ginormous guidebook, this comprehensive rules book, and you memorize it to the point where you can pass a test and you can, you know, perform before a judge at an event and demonstrate that you understand the rules uh, mentally and practically. It's a lot harder than that in Yu-Gi-Oh! Imagine if Magic the Gathering were held together by thousands of cards with individual rulings. Yes, that is how Yu-Gi-Oh! works. It's actually worse than that, <laughs> now that I think about it. It's actually worse than that, because there was a tournament... You know what, I'm gonna go to the video. There's a tournament that happened recently where a player could say this. There was this weird ruling at this YCS Atlanta where it hits extra deck monsters as well. And only at this tournament. And only at this tournament, weird. which was... They announced that after, um, after we all sat down and announced round one. Um, and they announced this ruling, and then everyone was so shocked. Um, 
I was happy because I main deck two. <laughs> um, oh, man. So it definitely benefit. <laughs> it really helped. How is that possible? The answer is because there's not a comprehensive rules. The judge at the event, or judges, decided for this event, this is how the card will work. This is my interpretation of it. Even though that's not how it... Oh my goodness. Even though it's not how it worked even the majority of the time. That is what happens when you don't have comprehensive rules. You can have disagreements between judges that affect the way that a tournament is played. Okay, I need to move on. The next one is lack of support for their pro players, for a pro scene, which is to say the lack of a pro scene, essentially. In Magic the Gathering, it was a big enough deal that platinum player support was being cut that we had a hashtag pay the pro, as I think it was, for some time. So much so that when Enter the Battlefield came out, the documentary, it was lost against pay the pro, hashtag pay the pros. It got underwhelmed. Um, that's how big of a deal it is in Magic the Gathering. And this makes sense when you think about it. If you're like me and you follow Magic as a competitive scene, you maybe have some players of which you're a big fan and that you follow all the time. I, for example, like Tom Ross, you know, in fact, and he's kind of moved on in modern, 8-rack and such. Uh, Ross Merriam, Elves Master, Craig Wesco, White Weenie Champ. I, I like archetype specialist. Uh, someone else might like someone who's dedicated to control, or someone with Reed Duke's hair, known as Reed Duke, or <laughs> some other, for whatever reason, there's a player or group of players that draws you in. But you notice that those players tend to keep showing up time and time again, and part of the reason for that is that they keep getting support from Wizards of the Coast. If you are, um, so here's another example. I like Super Smash Bros. Melee. I'm going to talk about Melee specifically because it's the one I, I know the most about. In that case, you don't have official support from Nintendo, or you have barely any support for Nintendo. Instead, players get their support from other companies. Uh, Team Liquid, Cloud9, HTC, Team Solo Mid, etc. These support their players because they themselves are either a company or supported by companies, but Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh! can't really have that sort of scene. There aren't tons of companies that want to be sponsors of players or teams, and so you need that support, at least in the short term, at least to get yourself off the ground, from something like Wizards of the Coast, from the parent company. Wizards understands this, at least here in North America, at least in the TCG. I can't speak to how it works in the OCG. They don't seem to do that here. Every now and then you'll see a player like, for example, all of the Yu-Gi-Oh players that are big that I know are people I know. They're, they're people I personally have met. Corey McDuffie, Patrick Hoban, those are basically it. Um, the, the brothers from Super Games Inc., whose names I am worried about mispronouncing, <laughs> Benjamin and, oh my goodness, and never mind. So there are, there are not that many, and I don't know anyone outside of my state, not even my whole state, this small region I'm in. Okay. If I could wave the magic wand, Yu-Gi-Oh! would support its players more so that we would get more invested in watching the events, so that more people would watch the events, so that eventually we get to the point where we don't need to, or at least to the same extent. Is the long and short of that one. Now, my number one reason, my number one thing that I dislike about Yu-Gi-Oh! is that they call deck techs deck profiles. No, that's not actually a reason, but seriously, why? Why? <laughs> Okay, no, no, no. But that is actually a thing. They, they give them different names between the games. It's kind of cool how that culture has branched out. Uh, anyway, the actual reason, the actual number one thing that I dislike is the overuse of erratas. My most underrated card, no, the, the combination of my most underrated and favorite card is Goblin Recruiter. It's actually banned in Legacy. This goblin basically lets you stack your deck legally with goblins. 
you put them back in whatever order, and basically that means once you've gotten enough lands, gotten enough mana, your ether vials, whatever, out, you are set for the rest of the game. You know what you're going to draw unless your opponent mills you or makes you shuffle or something like that. And so you can just, for the rest of the game, draw straight gas, as we'd say. You can draw exactly whatever you want. Now imagine if uh, that card gets banned and then Wizards of the Coast realizes, oh god, we made a mistake. But you know what? We're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. We're going to print Goblin Recruiter in, uh, say, Iconic Masters 2. And we're actually going to give it different text, very different text. It's the same thing, except it now only works for the top five cards of your deck. Well, that radically changes the card. It goes from being ban-worthy in Legacy to... I mean, I guess it's still playable, but it's only the top five cards. It's basically a goblin with something like Index added on top. That's not very good anymore. At all. This happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! all the time. All the time. Relatively recently, we had a batch of a bunch of cards, something like five, all get changed together. And let me give you one example. My personal favorite of, the one, of them is Sangin. <laughs> this little idiot over here uh, lets you get any monster with attack 1500 or lower and put it into your hand when it hits the discard pile. That is not what this thing does now. Look at that gobbledygook. That is not the same thing anymore. Or a card that was so ridiculously overpowered that basically as soon as it got released to the public, it was banned, was Crush Card Virus. And I could get into a whole spiel on that one, but for right now, suffice to say, this is not what the card does anymore. This is what the card does. This, again, gobbledygook over here, changes the card completely and makes it actually kind of awful. <laughs> Imagine if and they haven't done this with something like Pot of Greed yet. If you know any Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you know Exodia, Pot of Greed, right? <laughs> In that order. And then maybe a few others, right? If you know nothing else about Yu-Gi-Oh, you know Pot of Greed and Exodia. Imagine if they changed Pot of Greed to just, out of nowhere, add a drawback to it. It would be like if they took Ancestral Recall and just errated it to be more mana or turned it into Brainstorm or something like that, and then it ceases to be Ancestral Recall. Oh, and by the way, that means that you're playing at a tournament where if you happen to have Sangin and your opponent has Sangin, that might cause a little confusion. <laughs> Someone might have to call a judge over just to resolve a difference on these cards because Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. There's something to be said for having erratas. That's absolutely something you have to do every now and then, when you make a big mistake as a company. Merith, I think, Will of the Wild, needed an errata immediately because they didn't have a clause saying that X couldn't be zero. That would have utterly just broken the card, right? Infinite, when this creature dies triggers, for instance. Okay, that makes sense. And even then, though, that's a small errata. That doesn't radically change the card into suddenly now it's Horde of Notions, or Thrag Tusk, or Shared Discovery, or whatever else you want it to be. Okay. Again, that all said, I actually really like Yu-Gi-Oh! I have a lot of fun playing it. I've been playing the same archetype for, what, years at this point now? I play the Yu-Gi-Oh! equivalent of show-and-tell, where you're dropping Iona, <laughs> is a, I guess. Um, I, I like playing that kind of deck. I, combo Prison? Okay. So I very much like it, and you can make it a skill-intensive game. But there are just some things that the company has done that I, I'm not a big fan of. And by the way, all that said, they're still doing something right, because according to the Guinness Book of World Records, they're still the largest trading card game in the world by number of cards in circulation. I can't vouch for any other metric, number of players or tournaments or 
reach or anything like that, but at least in terms of number of cards, yeah, it's Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, A Little Apples and Oranges, they have a TV show, of course, but they also have this extremely liberal reprint policy relative to Magic the Gathering. Magic, okay, you're gonna get a master set every now and then. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! You get these non-limited print runs every year, sometimes more than once a year, that get cards that people actually want out in buttloads. <laughs> Which makes Yu-Gi-Oh! not a very good game as an investment, but as a player that just needs a reprint. Remember that Yu-Gi-Oh!'s only major format is the, is the equivalent of Legacy. And yet, here we are. Okay, that was your epilogue. That was the tangent at the end there. Thank you for listening to me ramble for a bit. I really do appreciate it. Alright, take care. I will see you all later. Bye-bye.